Greetings to everyone at ICCF24. Uh, my name is George Agelli and I should like to talk about one uh, very interesting and, uh, and uh, potentially very useful method, uh, direct energy production by Elianar. What is the effect? It's a plasma oscillation which generates uh, electrical energy. But uh, uh, I shall uh, elaborate later how this uh, very strange uh, oscillation takes place. I have written previously eight very long paper in the Infinite Energy uh, magazine of roughly 150 pages. And in order to to understand uh, this whole process, I strongly recommend you to read these papers. We have submit, submitted a patent application, which is uh, clearer with the technical details. The aim of the project to explore the specifics, the uh, physics of direct electric energy production. We had the source as uh, forgotten patents and forgotten academic uh, research, mainly British. And I had more than 25 years lab experience on replicating forgotten test results of Chernetsky and Korea. Our challenge has been, given the financial constraint, to understand the chain of several physical processes, to increase the efficiency of catalytic fusion, finding the most important engineering technical parameters, and of course the big enemy has been to improve quality control. As it produces electrical energy, one can charge uh, batteries. So, for example, uh, one can charge uh, cars, electric cars. I see personally great potential in electric airplanes because one advantage of this device and this uh, process that it has a very advantageous uh, uh, weight and power ratio. So onboard generation of electrical energy is possible, though this device is very crude. This is more or less a research uh, device, but uh, it can be uh, built into a more sophisticated, much better device. The most important test parameter was for us uh, to find out uh, the specific peak energy densities, the, the peak power of the burst, and those were in the order of megawatts per square millimeters, though they were short bursts. It is possible to estimate that one kilowatt uh, tubes are possible uh, to design and manufacture and uh, the specific weight is also of importance. Uh, we estimate that 10 kilowatts per kilogram is possible. Therefore, the uh, electric airplane is not a pipe dream. The manufacturing cost is estimated uh, to be relatively cheap, around uh, 100 US dollar per kilowatt. Uh, the device in its simplest form is portable. Uh, as you see, it, it drives uh, uh, actually two resistors and input-output. I shall uh, tell you about the details later. And uh, gra gratis, uh, there is a small neon tube. It is portable. It is driven by three batteries. Uh, this is a, a high-voltage uh, transformer. With a feedback, in principle, in the long term, uh, it can be uh, self-sustaining. So there is no point of uh, having uh, external uh, batteries. Actually, uh, there are three major parts of this device. One, the input part is a <clears throat> high voltage uh, relaxation oscillator. Uh, which is quite simple. There is a source of, of current and voltage, and this capacitor is charged through a, a resistor. There is a salt pipe of discharge uh, with the help of relaxation oscillator, which has a pretty bad efficiency for two reasons. First of all, uh, this high voltage, roughly 2 kilowatt uh, 
uh, power supply has an efficiency of uh, about uh, 40% or so, but uh, the relaxation oscillator itself has a 50% efficiency. So in this uh, uh, simple device, which I have shown you before, uh, only maybe the quarter of the input energy is reaching uh, the discharge tube, which is the soul and spirit of this whole uh, device. It is actually uh, <coughs> the uh, reactor where catalytic fusion takes place. Temperatures. Let me show you the device in its uh, simplest form again. So uh, these are the batteries right here. The high voltage uh, transformer with a 40-50% efficiency is this black uh, tube-like uh, device. Uh, these capacitors are these little uh, yellow capacitors. And we have uh, the diodes I right here. I will show you. And uh, uh, there is an inductivity right before the uh, reactor tube. Why do we need actually the inductivity and uh, the diode? Simply because uh, after the discharge, after the sparks, and we have uh, shown you the sparks before, uh, the <clears throat> there is a, a, a very brief uh, series of explosions of uh, uh, catalytic uh, fusions, LANR processes, but it would work uh, both ways. However, we don't want to feed it back uh, to the power supply, therefore we need a high voltage, very fast diodes and, and, and an inductivity because the available diodes are not fast enough, not high voltage enough, and then their opening voltage is uh, too high. So this inductivity, which I have shown you before, is really needed. This is the input part. Uh, this H is the capacitor. The middle part is actually the, the fusion reactor. It's right here. I shall uh, show it you uh, later. This is practically a deceptively simple looking uh, discharge tube. We have uh, described that at the cathode, the voltage is uh, the sawtooth uh, shape. Note that 2 millisecond is one division. The output, on the other hand, on the anode, right here, the fusion oscillations, the burst appear, and please note that 500 nanosecond is uh, the division of, of time. So after each of the discharge, a very powerful fusion explosion takes place and that is driving the system. So the sparks are visible between the cathode and the anode. Uh, the gas is actually uh, hydrogen. It's a mixture of hydrogen and deuterium. However, when we used other gases like dry air or, or helium, there was no effect whatsoever. The discharges are actually absorbed or extracted by another resistor over here, or we also use a discharge tube. This is the discharge tube connected uh, to the anode via a capacitor L uh, and with a switch uh, SW. In my opinion, LENR, uh, the area of cold fusion or low energy nuclear reaction, is much, much wider than ever expected. Of course, the most uh, well known is the palladium, uh, deuterium, is a uh, heat yielding Pons Fleischmann uh, kind of uh, reaction. This is the most widely known uh, in the last 30 40 years. The other, also, other effect yielding heat is the nickel and uh, 
uh, and hydrogen. I had hands-on experience with the Petter, Petterson's uh, cells. I was not very happy. It, it always broke down after two days. The next uh, field where I had expertise is the transmutation uh, is a dusty resonant plasma. And in my opinion, uh, this is the most ubiquitous, uh, most frequent form of uh, cold fusion. It is driving the stars and, and quasars because the interstellar dust is falling into stars and it is fueling uh, the corona of the stars, which are always uh, orders of magnitude hotter than the surface of, of any stars. This is a resonant dust fusion device burning uh, coal without CO2 with the help of uh, LENR heat generation. The uh, other area, mm. cavitation uh, bubbles underwater, uh, sparky uh, discharges, which is uh, causing heat and transmutation, or the heat may split water into oxy gas, uh, like uh, the water uh, buggy of Stanley Mayer. The fourth area, which I am familiar catalytic quasi-particles, so when uh, actually uh, cold fusion or LENR is mediated by heavy uh, electrically charged particles. Uh, one is the plasmons, polaritons, uh, which is yielding heat. I have built uh, such a devices also working with hydrogen. And we are talking now in this presentation uh, those uh, driven or catalyzed uh, by condensed plasmoids and uh, only in this area we have electrical energy uh, production uh, in my own uh, personal uh, experience though there are other electrical uh, methods as well and the fifth area is biological transmutation uh, and in, in it is hotly debated known for 200 years and it is uh, fully banned. Uh, I'm not talking uh, in details about this. We are able to measure quite well the input energy and the output energy with the help of a small calorimeter. It looks like this. Usually we fill it up uh, with uh, oil or some kind of heat uh, conducting uh, grease and uh, we are able to measure the temperatures after the discharge, after the sparks, and we have uh, shown you the sparks before. Uh, the, <clears throat> there is a, a, a very brief uh, series of explosions, uh, uh, catalytic uh, fusions, LENR processes. The, uh, on the receiving or the extraction end, uh, we have this uh, uh, resistor inside, uh, inside uh, the calorimeter. Here is the resistor. And uh, usually we take a test run which takes 20 minutes. We wait until everything is in a steady state. And uh, these calor calorimeters are always uh, calibrated uh, by a DC power supply. So we are able to tell uh, what is the uh, power input uh, equilibrium temperature curve. So this is a simple but reliable method. And in this way, we were able uh, to, to measure that uh, the power input output ratio is uh, uh, between 2 and uh, at, at the best uh, 20. However, with the help of feedback, it can be even uh, higher. This effect was uh, 
discovered many times. Uh, Tesla got uh, three patents uh, on the fundamentals of this effect. However, the first uh, widespread uh, academic study was done in England uh, by Norman Cooley uh, and Patterson and uh, Irvine uh, Messon uh, on uh, the production of neon and helium by electrical discharge. Actually, in our uh, device, we are also producing some helium and, and probably neon. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, when these British researchers uh, were, they were not interested uh, in energy production or ha they had just no idea that it may happen. Anyway, their test results were published in the proceedings of the Royal Society just two weeks before the breakout of the First World War and uh, the participants, uh, the young uh, researchers were actually drawn into the army and, and perished and no one ever took up this line of research. And I have to mention G.G. Thompson who discovered the electron. He published in the science uh, an important paper uh, about the uh, the finding of tritium, but they had no name at that time, he just called X3. Uh, the title is The Appearance of Helium and Neon in Vacuum Tubes. And the vacuum tubes uh, are quite simple, straightforward. In hydrogen, they are making sparks, uh, practically the same thing which we are doing. However, we are using uh, an input and uh, output energy measurement as well. And in our case, uh, our device is heavily optimized. And I have to tell everybody uh, that uh, if they start to do these experiments on their own, uh, it will be more or less futile. It took me some 15 years of, of perspiration and uh, daily frustration until we figured out the know-how and the details of this uh, process and the device. Actually, in the eight papers uh, uh, in the Infinite Energy magazine, we'll help you with the background, but we have submit, submitted a patent application which is uh, clearer with the technical details. And the two together will uh, give a, a nice comprehensive uh, view about the effect. Actually, I found some some 20 uh, granted U.S. patents uh, on the field of uh, catalyzed fusions, all related to, to spark discharges, either in water vapor or in hydrogen. But these inventions were always by accident, and that's the problem. Uh, these uh, patents are practically useless, irrepeatable, because the inventors who stumbled into this effect simply uh, by luck, had no idea what caused it. They had no idea how to make uh, this effect uh, permanent and uh, of very high efficiency, except Henry Morey and Nikola Tesla, but, but they never left us a full description of the device. So our disclosure will be the first one, which is able uh, to explain fully the physical process and the, technic and the necessary technical background to it. In a, a catalyzed uh, uh, process, actually, always needs some material, which is the catalyst. In our case, the catalyst is the so-called condensed plasmoids, which were discovered and forgotten uh, several times, at least a dozen times. Ken Shoulders uh, got five U.S. patents, very detailed, very well written uh, uh, patent, uh, of how to generate uh, these condensed plasmoids. And uh, they are actually looking uh, uh, like uh, <clears throat> a necklace uh, made out of pearls. Actually, these are highly charged, electrically charged uh, particles, and that's the strange part of it. Uh, shoulders called it uh, heavy electrons. Others who discovered it, uh, for example, the Russian Messiats, called it uh, as uh, explosive discharge. 
but uh, the researcher who measured it uh, actually the the mm, the church itself is a german researcher just before the breakout of the second uh, world war <clears throat> he published a book on it uh, much later electron avalanches and breakdown in gases he called this effect as an electron avalanche and uh, he was able to measure that uh, the overall charge of these uh, condensed plasmoids of this necklace was at most uh, in the order of uh, 2 billion charges, but uh, much uh, frequent is when uh, there are only 100 million electrons in one necklace or, or uh, charge pairs. So the secret is uh, of this process, how to generate efficiently uh, these uh, highly charged uh, uh, quasi-particles. And uh, actually, it requires an immense amount of uh, know-how practice to do it repeatedly efficiently. It took me about 40 years of, uh, of effort to figure out that uh, this is uh, uh, a catalytic fusion process. Uh, catalysis is uh, really widespread in biology, but in, in industrial chemistry as well, but not in fusion, it is not known. And uh, it has uh, several steps, the catalysis, but the catalytic agent, the condensed plasmoid, was discovered uh, several times. And uh, I show shoulders a patent uh, right over here. But as discussed before, the German Heinz uh, Rader measured at first uh, the electric charge of these uh, heavy electrons or avalanche. Uh, the same was independently with the Russian uh, Messiads or Takaki Matsumoto in Japan. All of, of them discovered uh, uh, this, uh, the, this uh, <clears throat> condensed plasmoids or heavy electrons independently, they are quite uh, stable. Uh, and uh, that is the, the point. Actually, <clears throat> catalyzed fusion takes place in the following uh, manner. Let's suppose that uh, this uh, necklace chain of uh, heavily charged uh, quasi-particles are attracting uh, a uh, proton accelerating and uh, the proton, if it is uh, fairly fast, it may acquire enough energy. It is uh, 0 0.78 uh, million electron volts. So instead of the proton and an electron, a neutron will be formed and the neutron is able to participate a slow neutron we are able to participate in many processes and most frequent is that a proton will react uh, with a neutron forming a deuterium and that will release energy. A deuterium again uh, will react with the next uh, electron uh, forming tritium and so on and so on. So this is the energy producing part of the process. There was an unwanted side effect. We observed a transmutation. Carbon deposits uh, appeared on the surface of the cathode when the input current exceeded a threshold value. The hydrogen was generated in uh, phosphoric acid and the electrodes were stainless steel. After reading uh, hundreds of monographs and uh, papers on gas discharge, I have found only one one sentence uh, uh, description <clears throat> how to make uh, uh, condensed plasmoids and it is from the book of von Engel and the figure is uh, smaller than my, my finger uh, on uh, creating this toroidal type of structures which we see here. Actually the symmetry, uh, the concept of symmetry is very poorly described in uh, physics, in classical electrodynamics uh, the rotation uh, is completely missing. That is one major problem. Therefore, symmetry operations are unknown. So when we have to make efficiently 
this kind of uh, condensed plasmoids, there are a number of factors uh, to be taken into account. So this deceptively simple uh, looking uh, uh, gas discharge uh, device, in fact, is very complicated to design and uh, a small deviation will ruin the effect. This is the reason uh, the <clears throat> map of operation where it, it works, it is uh, like a leopard skin. Uh, there are tiny isolated uh, parameter areas where it works, otherwise you will find nothing. Actually, in all textbooks, uh, the, uh, on gas discharge, the very uh, <clears throat> notion of this uh, uh, condensed plasmoid is there. Uh, this is the example of a uh, Nasser. It is always here, this huge negatively charged uh, blob, but no one had uh, the courage or curiosity to ask what keeps uh, them together. Because when this object attracts a proton and accelerates, uh, thus a neutron is formed, then uh, we know well that classical electrodynamics strictly forbids the existence of such a highly charged object. But so does uh, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation of mic microscopic quantum mechanics. It also forbids, yet uh, it exists, it has been uh, found and invented many times. So unfortunately here we are dealing with the internal troubles of quantum mechanics. We are addressing here problems with the very foundations of physics. Fortunately, from engineering viewpoint, we can uh, use it and we can use as an eco-friendly solution, a sustainable energy production uh, device. Why is it so difficult to find uh, uh, the proper technology uh, and uh, the physics behind uh, this catalyzed fusion? One major problem is that uh, for effects are involved and each of them are really, really distant from each other. And it is unusual that somebody has all the necessary skills for the four major areas. That is a thorough understanding of microscopic quantum mechanical effects, uh, how to form efficiently condensed plasmoids. The other uh, major area is uh, plasma physics and within plasma physics sparks discharge, non-sustained uh, discharge and uh, and this is uh, creating uh, these condensed plasmoids uh, macroscopic quantum mechanical effects. In the LENR part we have two process neutron formation and fusion by neutrons and of course the whole circuit is unusual. We have to generate and capture Post electric circuits actually with three different time constants. Condensed plasmoids are very varied, very unusual uh, <clears throat> objects. In my opinion, it is a macroscopic quantum effect in the same measure as uh, ferromagnetism or superconductivity or superfluidity. In most textbooks, for example, it is written that uh, a soft uh, iron piece is always attracted uh, to a magnet. This is not true. Uh, sometimes there is a place where actually <clears throat> a permanent magnet is uh, not attracting but repulsing a piece of uh, soft iron. And also ferromagnetic effects are not necessarily made of iron, for example, this is copper aluminium alloy. So uh, macroscopic quantum effects are, are not yet fully discovered, they are very weird. And uh, it, it is the secret uh, of our device how to make efficiently these macroscopic uh, catalytic agents. And, uh, and uh, it is a matter of life and death. However, this uh, <clears throat> macroscopic quantum objects, uh, these necklaces or, or condensed plasmoids are even stranger than, let's say, superfluidity. 
uh, because they are nearly stable at room temperature, so you, you don't have to cool it down. It is, uh, in a sense, similar to ferromagnetic materials. I should like to talk about uh, my previous 15 year his history of frustrations with this condensed plasmoid effect. I have spent uh, in a private lab 15 years as uh, the team leader on the Korea and Chernetsky devices. Both of them are arc discharges, transient arc discharges, and definitely based on our effect, uh, that is the condensed plasmoid formation. However, the common feature of all these inventions, of course, that they stumbled into this effect as usual by accident, and they had no idea what is driving it really. What you see here on this picture is a uh, two uh, parallel circular aluminium plates, a uh, very thick one, though the tube is already very, very opaque, simply due to the amount of uh, evaporated and condensed uh, uh, aluminium uh, droplets. Therefore, uh, the tube is not transparent. Note two, two things very important, that the two thick uh, circular cathodes and anodes are symmetrical, and they were not entirely virgin uh, surface, not smooth, but had to be initiated by millions of sparks before the effect started to appear. Moreover, it's a grave mistake of Korea that we never used the hydrogen in this experiment, but usually organs. Korea completely missed the essence of this phenomena. He thought that this burst or, or excess energy explosions are the consequence of the oscillations of the universe. This is completely false, but he was not aware that this is a kind of alien R effect, which I previously discussed. Chernetsky also used a roughly similar arrangement, though, let's say, between two pins, and he used extensively hydrogen. In fact, he realized that this excess energy burst appeared in, in hydrogen. Let me show you the next picture. This is the same cube from a different angle. I have uh, a number of uh, similar photographs. Note here that uh, in order to avoid uh, that the discharge will start at the back of the electrodes, all the electrodes are glued to the very base, so only uh, the front of the electrodes were able to initiate the discharge, uh, that is uh, the cathode. We had uh, years of frustration with this problem that the discharge never started and never ended up where we wanted between the phases, but always on a much longer route, starting from the back of one uh, electrode, the cathode, and ending on the back of the anode. So we tried different uh, paints and so on, but the best solution was actually to stick uh, with a glue the backs of the electrodes to this uh, uh, plexi uh, basis, what you see here. And there is one more thing uh, which was also contributing uh, to the demise and the frustration and the uh, useless results uh, that the pressure, what we used, was the same as recommended by Korea and Chernetsky, that is uh, the millibar range or even 10 to minus 4th, sometimes 10 to minus 5th uh, bar, which is very, very low pressure. Favori uh, it favors the glow and never the spark discharge. On this picture, you can see the Chernetsky experiments where the electrodes, uh, the tube is in the middle, the electrodes are comparatively of a small uh, surface. The electrode diameters were roughly 2-3 millimeters, sometimes 5 millimeters, and uh, Chernetsky always used molybdenum surface, which was, uh, in my opinion, not the best for this uh, application. And in my opinion, uh, one of the secrets of, of this whole phenomena, how to prepare the cathode, that is, uh, a semiconductor is uh, necessary 
in order to have uh, this effect. Now you see the device on the test bed. Itself the tube is too small to be visible. There are a number of auxiliary devices, capacitors, power supplies, and you see a large uh, vessel on the left hand side, which is uh, a buffer for the low pressure. And the organ cylinder uh, looks at the seam uh, on the left hand side and the number of pressure gauges and, and voltmeters, the oscilloscopes are not shown here. This is from another angle, a slightly blurred. From above, a number of auxiliary electronic circuits for the high voltage and for the capacitors. The tube itself uh, is visible on the left hand side of this picture. Now you can uh, have a look at the Chernetsky tube in front, uh, which has a very small spark gap and uh, a very small area, and it's a uh, molybdenum. The advantage of this tube was uh, simply that uh, one can uh, assemble or disassemble uh, this uh, tube. Again, uh, a Chernetsky tube uh, from above. Uh, it is uh, visible that uh, the area between the cathode and the anode is, is a very small, couple of square uh, millimeters only. The gap distance is sometimes half millimeter, one millimeter, sometimes two millimeter or less. Now some of the test results uh, are the uh, voltage and uh, the current quite a brief period, it is visible that the voltage sometimes has uh, much higher peaks, uh, bursts, uh, sometimes quite high, and it is not due to the inductivities uh, in the circuits. Uh, these are much, much faster bursts uh, than uh, it would uh, as, as follow from the electronic uh, parts. The lilac color on the button is measured, it is the current, uh, so current and uh, voltage is also showing these bursts, the peaks, the, the fusions, the consequence of fusion. These are uh, the voltage and the current distribution as a function of time. Uh, one microsecond is one, one mesh. Again, it's already 500 nanoseconds and here one microsecond is one mesh. You can see that there are sometimes bursts, but the very essence of these uh, frustrating ex experiments that we usually had the uh, input-output energy ratio around 1. That is uh, too high to be acceptable for textbook physics, because in case of uh, transient uh, or discharges, the efficiency in terms of, of uh, electric uh, energy, of course, the efficiency is always uh, around uh, 5, 6, 7 percent. So around 100 percent, uh, the efficiency is too high to be a textbook physics uh, efficiency. However, it is useless for any practical application because uh, the COP of 2, 3 or let's say 5 uh, uh, should be uh, in order to have uh, any practical application. The reason of this failure was triple one, that uh, we had no idea uh, about what is causing the effect. There was always a, a severe internal fight within the group. My opinion, and I was alone, that this is not uh, vacuum fluctuations as suggested by Corel and uh, Chernetsky. Chernetsky was working uh, with close association with an excellent uh, Soviet scientist, uh, Saharov, Andrei Saharov, who was the independent inventor of the Soviet H-bomb. Thus, he was an expert on uh, hot fusion. But as being uh, very well educated on, on the features of hot fusion, he never understood that there could be another uh, form of fusion that is catalytic or cold uh, fusion. So Saharov ins insisted that this should be the consequence of uh, the, os uh, the vacuum fluctuations, the oscillations of the universe. And unfortunately, this physical model never led 
to any useful engineering method, how to use this physical method into uh, this device, uh, how to design, how to improve the engineering design. So this was a definite uh, reason for the failure. There was no clear physical flow pattern in order to understand what is going on. So this is again another usual, frustratingly uh, usual test results for voltage, occasional very high voltage bursts, and uh, we can see that on the lilac that the current is increasing, and then after this sh very short series of bursts, everything becomes normal. So this is uh, what we get, that uh, the increase in current, uh, the increase in, in oscillation potential is quite visible, but the output was never enough to get uh, well above uh, the 100% uh, efficiency. And that was extremely uh, frustrating, and that uh, led actually to the collapse of the whole project. Some more test results, uh, which came again and again. But I have to emphasize, but not always. Usually, out of 100 tests, uh, uh, these kind of ex experimental uh, large amplitude voltage and, and current uh, oscillations uh, happened quite rarely. Usually, we had blank or completely useless textbook physics uh, uh, transients. And, we had no idea what is going on, how come that sometimes it is successful, so we get these bursts, but usually we got absolutely nothing. So these are only the successful uh, experimental test results uh, during uh, the discharge transients, but what you see, the uh, increase of current and, and the appearance of unexpected, uh, very sudden bursts. One more. I think uh, that's enough. You could see the, the usual patterns, which we considered as a success. To conclude this talk, uh, here are some data about the prospects. The peak power density of the burst is in the order of megawatts per square millimeter. Uh, this is not a mistake, uh, uh, because it is sustained only for a nanosecondum, millisecondum time range, uh, each small explosion. The duty cycle is under 1 to the 1000. The estimated uh, sustained uh, power output of a large surface industrial uh, tube is around uh, 1 plus minus half kilowatt with very low heat release based on uh, the test results. The estimated power per weight ratio for a properly designed uh, industrial tube is up to 10 kilowatt per kilogram. The input-output power for the extraction circuit, the electric circuit, the power weight ratio is about the same as above. That is, the electric circuit is not heavy. Last but not least, the estimated manufacturing cost for a reactor tube plus electronics is somewhere under 100 US dollar per kilowatt.